Have you ever started on a journey with great intentions, but never quite arrived at the location you had intended? Or have you ever started to work on a project and you got into it and, and it was underway and it never did get completed? Unfortunately, there are a lot of characters that we run into throughout this history of the church as it's unfolding that they embark in the service of God, they start on the covenant path, they, they, they get their trajectory and they begin that journey, but then it seems they, they don't ever arrive. It is uh, – it's a sad thing to watch some of these stories unfold. Some of them we, we know the ending and it doesn't end well, others were left with a lot of question marks. We don't have a lot of information. One of those characters is Jesse Goss in uh, section 81. Uh, let's, let's tell you his story of, of who he was and what's going on in his life. So he starts out as a Quaker. Yeah, born in Pennsylvania, a lot of Quakers there. And as you guys might remember, Quakers are pacifists and they have a society of friends. And about age 21, when he's considered an adult, he's admitted into the society, and so that's the, that's the religious group he wants to be part of. And he, he was born in 1785, so he's about 20 years older than Joseph Smith. The War of 1812 breaks out, and he wants to defend his country, and so even though he's a Quaker, which declares pacifism, he, he wants to defend his country so that he can live in peace, and so he actually joins the Delaware militia, um, later marries, and uh, has a family, four kids, and actually his wife dies in 1828, um, soon after the birth of their fourth child. And he later remarries, moves to Massachusetts, and then he actually decides he wants to become a Shaker, which is, we've talked about in the past, a Shaker is a group that believes very much in the power of the Holy Spirit and God being with you and expressing those gifts by uh, physical manifestations, like you might shake as a sign that the Spirit is with you. And so uh, Jesse and his wife, Minerva, apparently they decide, well, yeah, let's join the Shaker group. They move out to Ohio about 15 miles east of Kirtland, and they're living in this communal society, and that's when he meets the, the missionaries. Yeah, so he's in North Union, Ohio, not far from Kirtland, when he ends up joining the church. So we don't know when exactly Jesse joined the church, but our first timestamp that we get for him regarding the church is on March 8, 1832. The prophet wrote, "'Chose this day and ordained Brother Jesse Goss and Brother Sidney Rigdon to be my counselors of the ministry of the presidency of the high priesthood.'" Fascinating because today we make a big deal about first counselor, second counselor. Uh, You'll notice Joseph listed Jesse Goss first, Sidney Rigdon second. Jesse is 20 years older than Joseph, as Taylor's already mentioned, and he's older than, uh, than Sidney. It's possible that he was actually put in as the first counselor, even though he's a brand new convert and Sidney's been around a lot longer. Uh, the problem is he gets called into this first presidency calling, and he only lasts for about six months before he's going to be excommunicated at near the end of the year in 1832. Yeah, yeah December, after, December after serving a mission. Now, on his mission, he, he goes uh, with Zebedee Coltrane, and they're traveling back through the, the North Union area where his wife, Minerva, lives. And by the way, Minerva did not join the church. So she had joined with them to become a Shaker and moved from Massachusetts out west onto nearly the frontier of Ohio, but she didn't want to join him as a, mission, uh, as a, as a member of the church, and now he's going back to preach the Shakers. And he kind of gets received like all the other missionaries had, like the Shakers are not really interested in the message. And so he's trying to get his wife Minerva to, to rejoin him as well as to join the church. With the children? With the children. Notice uh, the, the wording here. 
in a letter from one of the elders in the Shaker community we have access to by the name of Matthew Houston. He wrote a letter to Seth Wells about Jesse's visit to North Union. This comes out of the book Who's Who in the Doctrine and Covenants. Quote, I presume you was acquainted with Jesse Goss from Hancock. He was here a few days since after his wife Minerva. She utterly refused being his slave any longer. He had to go away without her. Although he tried what the law could do for him, he was very much enraged, threatened to take away Minerva's child. She presented it to him, but he went away without it and her. He is yet a Mormon and is second to the prophet or seer Joseph Smith. This state of exaltation may tend to steady him or keep him away from us a little longer, for which I am heartily glad, for he is certainly the meanest of men." These are, these are real people with real struggles, and we, we don't know all of the details around Jesse's uh, excommunication, his life, what happened to him after. We know he's not going to live very long after this. He dies in 1836 at age 51. Yeah. In fact, he drops out of the record. You get a stray comment from his sister in 1873, um, and we really, that's about all we hear about him after August 20th, 1832, when Zebedee Coltrane's like, I'm so sick, I gotta return to Kirtland, and so they break off as being missionaries. So very little that we really hear about him, and again, we don't know about people's motivations, their hurts, their pains, their fears, and so sometimes it's very easy for us to say, well, that person got excommunicated, or that person sinned, and it is instructive for us to pay attention to where people have made mistakes, and hopefully we can be wiser. And Part of from it. That's what we learn in the Book of Mormon. But not to the point that we judge and we say, man, I'm, I'm so much better than this person. I would never have done the same thing had I been in their exact circumstances. So the amazing thing for me when you, when you get to know Jesse's story is to realize the ultimate judgment is in the hands of the Lord. It's, it's not our place to, to condemn him ultimately or pass final judgment. That's, that belongs to the Lord. What we do know is he began a journey and doesn't seem to have completed that journey as far as the church, as far as his calling in the First Presidency. That's a significant assignment where we didn't even have a First Presidency previous to this time in 1832, and it's not really going to become formalized until a little bit later, but he, he comes into the church, into this high position as a counselor to Joseph Smith, and then he leaves, falls away for, for one reason or another, or is excommunicated, and instead of the church now struggling, the church moves forward. That's the thing. We talk about journeys and arrivals. The, the church is on a journey collectively, and it will arrive. The promise is sure. There will be people who fall away or fall off of that, that uh, church along the journey. Or choose to step away. Or choose to step away, but the church will move forward. Section 81 is a classic example of that because what they did in the revelations moving forward, they didn't change section 81 that was given specifically to Jesse Goss to be a member of the First Presidency. They simply replaced his name with Frederick G. Williams. So the church moved forward. Jesse was replaced, so if you just picture the original, in place of Frederick G. Williams in verse 1, put in Jesse Gauss's name, and it's the same section, which implies that any member of the First Presidency as a counselor since 1832 could insert their name here, and it is beautiful counsel for not just members of the First Presidency, but I would propose for members of any presidency or members of any uh, group uh, or organization in the church, within the church. And as we jump, as we read this, remember that they didn't know about the First Presidency as we understand it today, and what they're taught is that this is going to be the presidency of the high priesthood. 
So even here, we don't yet actually have a full revelation of the totality of the first presidency. So it's simply revealed that there's going to be a presidency of the high priesthood. Even at this time, they didn't call it the first presidency. No. And so the church was still, remember, we're, we're early, this is March of 1832. We're not even two years old yet. <laughs> this is pretty young. Some two-year-olds are still trying to learn, well, I guess they're walking by age one, but yeah, this is, this is a very young church. 